Nicola, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's a great pleasure. Um, over the last two days, we have heard from scientists, clinicians, researchers, people very immersed in this work. People um, much more expert than me, <laughs> I think, is, is the way to describe this. <laughs> and we've just had that incredibly um, powerful story from Karen. Indeed. Um, but what we'd really love for you to share with us is your very unique perspective. So... Um, you're obviously a politician, um, but also have this very intimate knowledge of genomics through your role as chair of Genomics England. And in addition to that, um, live with a rare genetic condition. So we'd really love to hear from you what, to start with, you see as the most exciting element around newborn sequencing, but also if there's any things in the back of your mind that might um, be concerns or worries. Yeah. So I think, obviously, we've, we've just heard the case put incredibly eloquently uh, by Karen. So thank, thank you so much for sharing that. It's really important to have the patient perspective right at the heart um, of all of these projects that we do and never forget um, that that's why we're trying to drive forward the frontiers uh, of genomic science. Um, but the newborn sequencing program here in the UK, um, it is a research and evidence gathering program to make sure um, that we, we get this right from the outset and we consider all the ethical considerations, we consider the impacts on the NHS, um, and we get it right for patients um, in, in, in the first place. And so uh, for me, the exciting thing is, first of all, that we can take that um, diagnostic process right back to the beginning and really try and end the diagnostic odyssey once and for all. But we can't do that um, for every um, indication in the first instance. So this will start with, um, you, you've heard, I know, um, the presentations today. So this will start with those 200 indications which are actionable. And that's for the right reasons for ethical considerations, but also um, for reasons which are critical because if you're undiagnosed within the system, no one knows where to put you, and all of us who've been undiagnosed know what that feels like. But even if you're diagnosed, you need to have a clinical pathway. And at the moment, we have you know, only 5% of rare disease patients having any kind of therapeutic. So it's very important that if you do offer a diagnosis at that time, um, there is a clinical pathway and there is capacity within the NHS. That is the responsible and ethical thing to do. So at the moment, we're talking about building the foundations coming from a very low base, as we've heard, to have that early diagnosis, but also the route into clinical care. And the second thing on the research side for me is if you do start building up that data, we can start addressing this terrible paucity of therapeutics and improving diagnostics. And so for me, that's where the excitement lies. And, and we are working um, a little bit on the foundations of that second bit um, with ideas around um, a rare disease therapeutic uh, launch pad. And I know that the Oxford Harrington Institute are doing um, similar work um, because this has to be put right. We, we can't continue as we are. It's, that it's not only a scientific um, imperative to drive forward, but it's also a moral imperative. Thanks. That's a great insight that um, that the uh, pathway into precision treatments and therapies is a is a very exciting part of this. On that, I think we all feel like we're in a bit of a um, a whirlwind of technology at how fast pace the change has been in genomics, in the diagnostic setting, and and in therapeutics. From the lessons learned through Genomics England, I'm wondering how that might inform how we. Um, move all of this whirlwind into the public health setting and how that might look different to the, the diagnostic setting that we've been in? So what we found um, at Genomics England was um, the science wasn't as much the problem and the technology wasn't as much the problem. It was really integrating the science and the technology into um, routine care in a public health system, um, which is, while we do have an integrated healthcare system here, there's also fragmentation. Um, we know of data sets, but also of decision making, procurement and so on. And when you do genomics, obviously you have to have um, one single national data set and it makes sense to drive it nationally. Um, but we do it through the network of the genomics laboratory hubs. And so trying to um, make that system work in a way which is clinically meaningful 
meaningful um, with turnaround times that work for patients um, has been super challenging. And it's things like, you know, how, how do you get the tissue samples back and forth in, in meaningful time frames um, for uh, the cancer patients and for rare disease patients? Um, how, how, do you, how do you make that process work? And so getting the right consent in place, um, getting the right um, validation process in, is in place. We need more clinical scientists so we can return the results in a timely fashion with the right validation. Um, and th those are the things uh, which we found have been most challenging. And we're working all the time uh, to improve that and make sure that we can accelerate processes. Uh, but it's timeliness, um, it's uh, a, a system-wide approach, so it works uh, in a reasonable way. Um, and it's also uh, making sure that there's equitable access, because obviously uh, we haven't always had equitable access across the country, and we need to put that right. Um, that's a great segue into my next question, which is a little bit more around equity. Um, so I understand that you were born in South Africa and you've advocated previously for funding in lower and middle income countries. And also that Genomics England does have that really impressive um, and enviable national approach. Um, and so I'm wondering what your views are on how we address equity both in a global sense when newborn screening is so varied across the world, but also within our own jurisdictions where it might be a bit fragmented. Yeah, so no one here needs to be told that our data sets um, are quite European white ancestry and that creates problems with um, bias and generalizability. And in order for us to improve that, we need to uh, put that right. So we have, um, have been funded for a, a diverse data initiative in order to start putting that right. Um, and there's a number of uh, programs uh, which are in place to address that. Um, Link 23, um, which is um, a research um, open source uh, program to put in place tools and um, a number of other resources to improve inclusivity um, of research. Um, but there's there's a lot more that needs uh, to be done if we're going to improve this. So we're starting a number of um, uh, collaborations uh, with other cohorts such as All of Us and um, uh, we've been speaking to H3 Africa to work out how we can improve recruitment and um, combinations of data sets so we can improve this research. But there is a lot more to be done because obviously when you go to um, countries which have uh, tremendous diversity of uh, population and I've just come back from Sao Paulo where they're very keen to uh, recruit into genomic data sets their main problem is not uh, the quality of the science or the availability of sequences um, it is actually the their, act, their clinical data set is incredibly fragmented and it is difficult to pull that clinical data set into the genomic data set. Um, and so we often at Genomics England provide um, expertise and um, support for those countries because it's only once we have a number of generalized data sets ac across different countries that we're, able, that we're going to be able to make the kind of progress that we want in diagnostics um, for different communities. But it is a priority for us. And any researcher here who wants to give us advice would be very grateful for that. Excellent, thank you. I was thinking, as you said that, that um, this kind of uh, like global community that we've got in the room is going to be really important in moving that forward. Um, the next question I want to ask you is, I guess, um, based in your role as a politician. Um, so I'm a physician and I see my area of expertise as um, helping my patients understand something about their disease or condition. And I guess as a politician, I, I maybe see your role of, as an expert in gaining public trust and facilitating public engagement to form the basis of policy and decisions. And so I'm wondering if you can give us some insights into how we might be able to take the public along on the journey that we're on with newborn sequencing. So, I mean, I, I have a really odd um, career path. Uh, you've sort of alluded to it, but I, I, came, I grew up in a medical house. My dad, my dad was a consultant cardiologist, but then from the age of seven, I was very ill. I, I had a, a, a red disease, but nobody could work out what the problem was, so I bounced around through specialists. But growing up in a medical house, it was assumed that we would be able to access the care, and we just couldn't. And the, my experience was that... Um, as, I, as I got sicker and sicker at various different points, that the health system basically consumed my life. And it got to the point where I was an MP, and, um, I, and I was trying to find out how I could carry on working and still um, access care. 
and I was being sent to a clinical appointment in one hospital and a diagnostic in another hospital while collapsing every day because my autonomic system wasn't working. And the doctor in the room just said to me, well, maybe you're just going to have to give up work. And the sort of bells weren't working. And, and my experience was that the health system would just consume your life if you didn't let it. And it's an exact experience of, of what Karen has, has expressed, but just on a much less uh, significant uh, model. And in the end, I was diagnosed in sort of 20 minutes by a neurologist who just happens to have experience of my condition after, after 30 years of getting sicker and sicker. And then I was put into a position where I had the policy making experience and now I'm in the operational experience. And so my perspective on how you gain public support for programs like this is you reflect back into these different communities, whether it is the participant community who are so desperate for an outcome, whether it is the clinician community who want to see that they can improve care for patients who need the care but they don't necessarily have the answer, whether it is the politicians who want to make the right decision but are operating within their own limits and incentives and are often trying to do the right thing, um, or whether it is the general public who just want to know um, that their data is being used safely and when the NHS um, is um, out there for them, it will give them the right answer sometimes and they just don't want to think about it the rest of the time. And so when you are trying to communicate what newborn sequencing is and what it's there and why it's there for you. You have to understand all the different um, constituencies and cohorts that you are talking to and why they would be incentivized to support a program and a project like this. And each one of those communities has a reason why newborn sequencing is vital and why it will improve their environment, why it will change healthcare for the better and why it matters. And we have worked very hard at Genomics England in our public dialogue to reassure about consent, to reassure about data management and security, to reassure about the ethics that we've considered around how we're going to um, sequence and which conditions we're going to sequence, to explain about the careful consideration about um, the long-term vision about a, a, life a lifetime genome. Um, but in the end, um, it is also for those who will be affected the most to stand up and say, uh, this is why it matters, because at the moment, the healthcare system is not working for those with rare diseases and other conditions, and we need a change. Fantastic. It's so um, uh, amazing to hear you bring together so many of the... I mean, you haven't been here in the last two days, but you're really bringing together a lot of the things that have been discussed. And and that's I think... a relief, because I kind of feel like I'm <laughs> rambling. That's <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, I think you're touching on so many of the things that have been covered, um, and it's a really nice way to bring everything together that we've been um, that we've been talking about over the last few days. I guess um, on your own diagnosis, it's it's unlikely when we hear about all the different criteria um, that we're currently using in projects on newborn sequencing that it would be something that um, would be picked up on newborn screening. But as the field is constantly evolving, I guess we don't you know, quite know what the impact will be in the future. So what do you think that um, big picture and evolution looks like, I guess, in the UK as somewhere um, that you're most familiar with? And what kind of impact might that deliver over time? So, I, so, I mean, where we start with is, like, directly improving the diagnosis, but then also care pathways and, in the medium term, um, access to therapeutics for rare disease patients. And that's really important. And as an outcome in itself, we cannot overstate the importance of that. And I think we should continue to fight for that. And I really want to send a clear message. I'm very unhappy when I hear sometimes out in the community that you know, rare disease needs to be put to one side because the NHS is under tremendous pressure and we just need to focus on common diseases and the pressures that those are creating on the health system. Because rare disease and the diagnostic odyssey creates an enormous pressure on health systems. It's often unnoticed and slightly hidden, but it is, it's expensive and it's distressing. And as I've said, there's a moral and there is a health economic uh, reason uh, to focus on this and to get it right. I also think that some of the lessons you learn 
women from focusing on solving rare disease problems will become increasingly relevant for solving wider problems across other diseases. Cancer is becoming increasingly stratified. So if you can uh, solve problems uh, in a rare disease structure, they will be um, generalizable across other diseases. Um, the second um, longer term uh, potential and Again, I'm not a scientist, so I, I put a disclaimer above this. Um, obviously, we're exploring more preventative uh, genomic solutions. So once you um, are in a position where you can potentially look at pharmacogenomics and um, looking at genetic indications for adverse drug reactions, and with these uh, potential data sets, you could reduce the impact on the NHS and, and make sure you're much targeted in the... Um, uh, medications that you are providing and that is very promising for the NHS and there's a lot of support for that because of course in with those indications you're looking at one in 16 admissions to the NHS are as a result of an adverse drug reaction. Um, we have obviously launched um, in another indication for, for the longer term, um, the cancer vaccines launch pad, which would be dependent on a lot of the infrastructure that these programs would develop. And so you're talking about thinking about um, an infrastructure which would start with rare diseases, but would then create um, an infrastructure for um, intervening earlier in disease when perhaps it's either asymptomatic or at least early, which would lead to better outcomes and less pressure on the health system. So this is long term, obviously, and a lot of evidence generation is necessary for that. But we're starting with the early building blocks of building that evidence. Some of it won't work, some of it will work. Um, but I am very pleased that where we start is with the rare disease um, challenges, which are absolutely front and centre, and we must respond to that. Excellent. And I, I, I just want to pick up on something that came through in one of the sessions earlier today. You've um, focused and talked about the diagnostic odyssey and how powerful um, sequencing in the newborn period might be to address that. There's been some um, thoughts thrown around about this new concept when we do get um, these, this sort of work underway about the therapeutic odyssey and how we balance um, identifying patients that are eligible for those um, kinds of therapies um, against, uh, you know, testing for conditions where a therapy is not available yet. And that's sort of catch-22, that if we don't screen for it, we don't have patients to enrol in the trials, but um, we don't want to be screening for things necessarily that patients don't have clear pathways for. Well, um, if, you, if you don't have a diagnosis in the health system, you are, it's very difficult to get any kind of management, let alone a therapeutic. So as somebody who bounced around from clinician to clinician and was diagnosed with an exceptional number of things that I did not have, I would always advocate on the side of getting diagnosed with a thing that you do have and even having a suboptimal management uh, regime while you can then contribute to the research which leads towards the therapeutic because health systems do not deal well with undiagnosed patients, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Uh, thank you. I think that's a really powerful message because we hear it from patient groups um, over and over that say, you know, my condition or the condition affecting me and the people around me is, is something that should be screened for. So we do hear that message, and um, I think a lot of us in the room are trying to balance it with um, that concept of, uh, of not putting a burden on people um, who, who don't have a diagnosis or don't have symptoms yet. The other side of this, which we haven't really touched on very much, is also health planning. So the health system does not know how to allocate funds, how to allocate care pathways, how to decide on where to put its budgets or how to... Um, decide on clinics or any of that if it doesn't know where the patients are or who they are. And so unless you are diagnosing the patients, unless you are gathering the data, unless you are analysing and researching what the likely growth of those uh, clinical co communities and patient communities are, then it is impossible to provide the right care for patients. And so we do need to um, as much as possible, um, diagnose and um, understand and research 
and then provide the appropriate care for those patients. And I don't think I've met a participant who has said to me, I wish I didn't have that diagnosis. Um, and I wish I wasn't contributing to research. At, at Genomics England, um, in our genomics medicine service, we have a 98% consent rate for participating in research. Um, because all those patients want to make sure that they drive improvements in the environment for rare diseases and for cancer for not just for themselves and for their future or for the rare disease patients in the UK, but for those around the world. And, you know, that is a, a, a very clear message which I have always had and I think that you have heard very clearly from Karen. That is an astonishing rate of involvement in research and I think... Um I'd be really interested if you have any insights on how you ha, how the trust has been built in Genomics England to be to be wanting to be part of that moving forward. Do you think there are any? Have you have you already heard about the participants panel here in we, the yeah, conference? Yeah, we have. That was mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that the participants panel and the way that that has been integrated into Genomics England has been super important um, because they are not. Uh, patient group which is there for show or for um, uh, consulting on a sort of semi-regular basis in a superficial way, but they're fully integrated into the infrastructure of Genomics England. They report directly up to the board, but also they don't just decide on how we design our programs like newborns or um, certain aspects of it, but they decide on the literal structure of the organization. So when we, for example, decided that we needed to transfer our data set into the AWS cloud because it's scaled hugely. So we now have um, over 22 petabytes of data because we are the largest whole genome data set in the world. And that's gonna obviously grow significantly with the newborn program. I mean, the 100,000 new, um, 100,000 that we'll sequence for the newborn program is the same size as the 100,000 genome project. So obviously it's double the data and we still have the flow of genomes that are coming in from the genomics medicine service. So you can imagine um, that data scale. And so we need to make sure that we have that data kept in a trusted research environment, that it is secure and that we can um, respond to the demands um, of that data. And so we, we, we keep it in, in that environment and the participants have an active role in making sure that not only is that data um, secure in cyber secure environments, but also that those who access it um, are um, reach the eth ethical standards. So if you're a researcher and you want to access it, you join our, either our GSIP that we've just recently renamed through our research strategy um, or the Discovery Forum if you're an industry partner. And um, if you want to um, look at it, we, we call it like an aqu aquarium. Uh, you can come and look at the fish, you can draw the fish, you could admire the fish, you could take your drawing away, but you can't take the fish with you. So, you know, you take your foreground IP, but you don't actually take the data out, you can't copy the data. Um, and um, there are consequences if, if you um, don't abide by the rules. And so this is how we build um, confidence. So we have um, secure and, and highly effective uh, tech uh, environment. We abide by the legal environment, the data um, uh, legislation. Uh, we have good governance um, and we have good ethics. Fantastic. I think um, we've got just over five minutes to go and I think we might bravely take some questions if anyone in the audience would like to, um, to ask anything of Nicola. Hello, um, Portia, SMA UK. Um, you said quite rightly that you think um, rare diseases needs to be front and centre. Do you think that the processes that the UK Newborn Screening Committee go through to put new, new rare diseases on the list, do you think they're fit for purpose for rare diseases um, when there's such a fast evolving landscape of new treatments? So I know Mike Richards has been doing a lot to um, work on updating and reforming um, the screening committee and thinking very carefully about stratification. We've been working very closely um, with the screening committee to communicate to them how we're planning the newborn program and they are very um, interested and we have made sure that they're apprised of every aspect of the health economics, the ethics, um, and the design of the
of the program and we are just going to make sure that we don't have a like a any kind of cliff edge at the end um, and there's been a lot of education that's gone on because obviously this isn't their natural wheelhouse um, and so I'm not going to say that I can sort of guarantee the outcome, um, but we're doing everything that we can to make sure that um, we will um, have sort of strong communication between them, between the Department of Health and the NHS, um, so that we can go forward. But I do understand your concern because there has been um, little progress until now, but I think uh, we are moving into a new phase. Good to hear. Just a comment. I don't know if it's useful, and I don't mean to pile on the UK in terms of their current traditional newborn screening status. I was surprised to learn that yesterday from Sir Michael Richards that they're only screening nine diseases. Uh, in the US, the National Academies of uh, Science, Engineering, and Medicine have a genomics roundtable that I attended about a year ago, and the topic was genomic implementation in the clinic. And during that two-day session, uh, I suggested that for implementation of genomics, the U.S. lags significantly behind the U.K., starting with the U.K. Biobank and Genomics England and some of the new projects with polygenic risk score clinical trials and the new board screening project. And not a single person at the U.S. National Academies objected to my statement that the U.K. was the leader in the world in the implementation of genomic medicine and that the U.S. lagged far behind. That's actually written in the report yeah. from that U.S. <laughs> National Academy. And I went on to say that I propose as a practical uh, suggestion that the next U.S. National Academy's Genomics Roundtable meeting should take place in London so that we could have our U.K. colleagues give us advice on how to accelerate genomic medicine implementation in the United States. So I don't understand that uh, discrepancy between being a leader in genomic medicine implementation broadly in the UK, but your traditional newborn screening be lagging behind uh, where, what we th would call standard in the United States. Well, we're trying to put that right. <laughs> I, I mean, I think the answer to that is watch this space. We're trying to put that right. We should be recruiting um, our first candidate very soon for newborn screening. So um, hopefully the concerns around uh, the hill prick will soon be uh, a memory. He's got a worrying smile on his face. I know. I, <laughs> you may. So. It's, everybody here knows that when I smile, it's actually a good thing. So you, we, we know. Not everybody, David. <laughs> We know each other a little bit. <laughs> so so um, you, you have our undivided attention of uh, 100, 150 people here, another 100 people online. Tell us what you want us to do. <laughs> I didn't prep her for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I know this was incredibly mean. You can you can you can come at me again later. <laughs> so I want you to talk about. I want you to go back to your communities and talk about why this program matters and be advocates and champions for the hundred thousand. This is going to be absolutely critical to creating evidence and to demonstrating. So, okay, I'm going to go back a bit. My, I and a number of our colleagues have been campaigning within government and elsewhere to get this program up and running since at least 2017. And there have been lots of people who have had significant and genuine anxieties for reasons that are sensible, such as ethics and the impact on the health system and diagnosing too many people that the NHS can't cope with or those who may get a false positive or those for whom there isn't a therapeutic. And so we have to demonstrate that this is a responsible program, that this is a program that the NHS can respond to effectively, that we have uh, set up a system in combination with the uh, screening committee that can meet those standards, and that critically has the support of clinicians 
who will want to um, order the tests and respond to the tests and um, support those who have diagnoses, and also the support of researchers who will then work with the data. So be our advocates and demonstrate support for this program because I really believe it will be game changing. So, so my comment on that to everybody here and everybody online is that please take that back to your governments because um, I think the, the UK is trying to do this here. And I just know, knowing a lot of you and actually knowing a little bit about some of the other governments, that they will listen to you and that there are people uh, like Nicola in government all over the world who totally get this. And so we have a wonderful advocate. We're blessed, lucky to have you. And so I, but I just know that you all know people. I know that, um, hmm, I probably shouldn't say, a certain, a certain uh, person from this group has spoken to the governor of her state um, about this. And so, you know, I would just encourage people to find your Nicola. Don't, don't oversell it, David. <laughs> Nicola, thanks so much for, for sharing all of that with us. It's Thank great you to so see much, you all. Baroness.